Hello, world history. All right, so today's lesson is on the revolts in Latin America and South America, and specifically, we're going to be looking at the key revolutionaries. So those would be the leaders that led these independence movements in Latin America, and then what uh, were their accomplishments. So we'll look at you know causes of discontent in Latin America, the causes of these revolutions. We'll look at Haiti's fight for freedom, Mexico, Central America, and then South American revolutions. So first, when we look at uh, discontent in Latin America and the underlying cause of these revolutions in places that were under Spanish rule, the way the system was set up, the social system, is part of the problem. And the way it was set up is that, you know, you had pen peninsulares, um, they were at the top. Those are the people born in Spain and who had immigrated um, to live in the colonies, the Spanish colonies in Latin America and South America. And the peninsulares are the they're the ones who have access to the highest jobs, which means that they can make the most money. Then below them you have the Creoles or Creoles, um, who are a hundred percent Spanish, meaning they are a hundred percent European but they were born in the colonies. And I really suggest that you, you take either notes on this or you, you copy down this triangle that you have here that you can remember it. So you have at the top, the peninsulares, below them, the creoles, the creoles. So the creoles, they're the ones who are European, but they were born in the colonies. They were not born in Spain. And even though they're 100% European, they have a ceiling on how high they can rise in society because they can't get the best government jobs. They can't get the best military jobs. And so here they, they live in the colonies and they're, actually, they're, they're limited to how high up they can get. And that's going to cause some resentment, right? They're going to be upset by this. Uh, now, at first, it's not a big deal because most of the people are peninsulares. Most of the people at the beginning when Spain first was um, colonizing in Latin America and South America. But as things go, and by the time, you know, as time goes on and we get, we hit the 1800s during the Industrial Revolution, you have a large number of Cre Creoles who are born of Spanish parents or descended from like the original Spanish settlers and who these Creoles now can't expand and can't get any, get any higher up than what they, what they are. They're stuck. And so that's going to cause some problems, some resentment, like I said. And then below them, um, in terms of how the Spanish social structure is, um, you've got growing numbers of mestizos and mulato, mulatos. And mestizos are people of mixed Native American and European descent. So mestizos are people born to Native American and European parents, right? Whereas mulatos are those people of mixed African and European descent in the Spanish colonies. So their parents are African and European mixed. And then below them, there are slaves and Native Americans who are not European at all, who are um, getting sick of this system as well, for obvious reasons. They don't like this system that's in place because um, they're at the bottom, right? They don't have like any power or rights, really. And on top of this social problem, social division and resentment from all these different classes, you have Enlightenment ideas that are going to inspire Latin America. Uh, so... Uh, Creoles especially are going to read the works of the Enlightenment thinkers. They're going to think about things like um, that John Locke had written about. They're going to hear about natural rights. They're going to hear about constitutions and republics. They're going to see the French Revolution and the American Revolution, read about it, and that's going to inspire action in Latin America. So really the Creoles are the ones who are reading those works and it's inspiring them, and they're the ones often leading these, these revolutions. So make sure you keep that in, in mind or write that down. And then what, what you, you really need is you need that one moment. In addition to having all these new ideas, you need that one moment that gives people the excuse or the reason to begin to take action. And really when Napoleon invades Spain during his time as the emperor of France, when he's going around conquering Europe, as you think back to the French Revolution unit. Remember, Napoleon invades Spain, gets rid of the Spanish king and replaces them with the king with his brother. Remember that? And the people in the colonies, because of this, they're like, that dude isn't Spanish. That's that he's French, right? Uh, I have no times, no ties to him. I have no loyalty to him. That's that's Napoleon's brother on the throne, and I don't really care about him. So now is the moment that we should get our independence because we're not really committing an act of treason. 
uh, because the leader of Spain isn't Spanish anymore. So we don't think we need to be, be part of Spain anymore, right? We're done. So now's a good time to revolt. So what you get is a couple of different revolutionaries. And actually what ends up happening is even before the Spanish colonists in Latin America successfully revolt, there is a revolution that erupts on the island of Hispaniola in the French colony of Haiti. Um, this is all happening at the same time. So at, this, at, the, at the time, France had a colony on, on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean Sea. And it was full of sugar plantations, and there were many, many, many slaves that were there working on the plantations, about a half a million slaves to be exact. So a man named Toussaint Louverture, he is one of them. He was a slave, and he leads a slave rebellion in Haiti. He was able to get his own independence from slavery. He's pretty much self-educated, and he gets inspired by these concepts of liberty, these enlightenment ideals, and he believes that what, what he wants to do is he wants to free the rest of the slaves in Haiti. And he's actually a pretty good military strategist, a pretty good military mind. He's a very inspirational person. And the slaves follow him. And there's a slave revolt, and they're able to overthrow the government. And they're able to defeat the French army. They're able to defeat actually a number of armies, including the British and Spanish even. And as a result of this, Napoleon ends up selling the Louisiana Purchase to the United States because of his loss to the Haiti. Haiti becomes independent because of the slave revolt. And Napoleon decides, I'm going to sell the Louisiana Purchase to the United States, which doubles the size of the United States like overnight, right? Um, and But also you get the independence, the first independent uh, nation besides the United States in the Western Hemisphere, which is Haiti, um, which was won by a slave revolt. Now, next, uh, when we look at Mexico, there's two Catholic priests who are responsible for the revolution in Mexico. You have Father Hidalgo, who was a Creole, and Jose Morelos, who was a Mestizo, and both of them call out for freedom. Um, so again, they want to make sh they want to make some pretty radical changes. Actually, they want to get rid of slavery. They want to give all people the right to vote. They want to get rid of the monarchy. They want to create like a republic. And remember, a republic is a form of government where officials and representatives, government officials, are chosen by the people. And what happens is, at first, a man named Agustin de Iturbide is against this. He's a very conservative thinker, and he's afraid of what's going to happen if you, um, if you get rid of slavery and if you overthrow the whole entire system. Remember, conservatism, conservatives, they want to keep the status quo, right? They don't want this radical change. So he initially works against Father Hidalgo and Father Morelos. But what ends up happening is when Spain, there's events in Spain that take place. When Spain reinstates their king, right? They replace, they, they get rid of Napoleon's brother, they reinstate their king again, and they sign a very liberal constitution, and they create a very liberal constitution. This is how events in Spain affected the fight for Mexican independence, because that event, the new liberal constitution, the, re, the reinstitution of the Spanish king, freaks him out, freaks out Iturbide, uh, because he's a conservative thinker. And this is a very liberal revolution in Spain. And so what he ends up doing is he, send, he, he ends up reaching out to the revolutionaries, um, specifically Father Morelos, right, and his followers. And he says, why don't, we why don't we come together, overthrow the Spanish, and let's see if we can come up with a better form of government. And what he really hopes is he really hopes to really expand the size of Mexico to include all of Central America. Uh, places like Guatemala, right, and um, El Salvador. But he never really completes that work. And eventually those new republics, like, for example, Costa Rica, becomes an independent republic. And so those places further south of Mexico create their own nations. Um, and then in terms of South America, Simón Bolívar is someone we've learned about already, and he is the one who leads the revolutions in South America, if you remember. So he's from Venezuela. He's a Creole. He continues his education in Spain. And while he's in Spain, that's when he's inspired by those Enlightenment ideals. Uh, I've already talked about this a, a couple months ago. And he tours France. He tours Italy. He sees all these things, and he has some really big ideas for what can happen in South America. And... When he's inspired by the Enlightenment, he makes this pledge 
that he's going to free Venezuela from colonial control, from the Spain, from control of Spain. And he seizes this moment with Napoleon's occupation of Spain. So as uh, he seizes this as the time, uh, the most opportune time, and he moves back to Venezuela and he begins to lead this revolution. And a couple of times he's driven out and he has to go and hang out in Haiti for a little bit. Um, but eventually he comes back and he launches this really ambitious plan where he's going to cross the mountains and be able to attack Bogota, uh, which today is the capital of Colombia. But back then, um, you know, the Spanish really didn't see this coming, his attack on Bogota. And Bogota at the time was the capital of the Spanish colonial headquarters there in South America. And by taking control of that, then he begins to become pretty successful from then on. And another successful leader is Jose de San Martin. And what's going to happen is that these two guys are going to join forces. And eventually San Martin turns his entire army over to Simon Bolivar, who is then able to move through throughout and free South America from the control of Spain. So from there, what he hopes to do is he hopes to unite all of South America and create a, a united uh, some kind of federation or a united South America, kind of like, um, kind of like the United States of America, but in the southern continent in South America, and that never really happens because, you know, he has um, he has a lot of difficulty. Geography is one of the problems that he runs into. It's not as geogra geographically conducive to being united as the United States is in North America, so that kind of prevents it and works against him. The other thing is you've got differences in terms of culture in South America and makeup, and that makes it really hard to form this united federation. You have Portuguese, some people speak Portuguese, some people speak Spanish, right? So they're kind of divided in that way in South America. So that never really comes to be. Um, for Brazil, what ends up happening, Brazil is obviously a major country in South America. What ends up happening is the Portuguese family, so Portugal was in control of Brazil, not Spain, you need to keep that in mind. And the Portuguese family is driven out of Portugal during this time. And they come to Brazil, where to their colony of Brazil. And while they're there, then they're, um, they kind of wait things out. And eventually, the Portuguese royal family is able to return back to Portugal and take over Portugal once again to come back to power there. And when they do, the Portuguese king leaves his son, Dom Pedro, there and he says here's the deal dude if if the people of brazil call for their independence i would just give it to them and then just figure out a way for you to become the emperor of brazil so that we're still in charge we're still in power but you'll let them think that they have their independence and what essentially is what happens brazil calls for their independence the people of brazil do that dom pedro agrees to this limited monarchy, and he ends up becoming the emperor of Brazil. And actually, that's going to be pretty short-lived because what happens is in the 1880s, then they're going to create a republic. Brazil will become a republic, a lot like the other countries in Latin and in South America. But the important thing to take away from this lesson about the South American revolutions is that their goals of a united South American state never come to fruition. And unfortunately, they simply traded one set of masters, uh, the Spanish um, and Portuguese, and those rulers, they traded that, that set of masters and rulers for another set of masters and rulers. They had emperors, like in the case of Brazil, uh, with Dom Pedro, despite the revolution, and they were divided still, right? They never had that unified South American state. So the goals of these revolutions were very much different than the actual results of these revolutions. So let me know if you have any questions in the meantime about this lesson, and I'll be sure to help you out.